Greetings, and welcome to Etz Heim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we're going to do a very fast teaching today, so try to keep up. They said I only have 20 minutes. <laughs> We're going to do a study today, and a lot of it is related to what you've been studying before in the past few weeks. But when you hear the message today, there's going to be a lot of emotions. There's going to be some that's going to love it. There's going to be some that's going to say, I don't know how I feel about that. But listen, and I want you to check for yourself after we're done today, to see if what you learned today is from God or not from God. That's really the only question. So let's get started. A little bit of a road map of what we're going to go through today. We're going to start at Revelation chapter 2 just as an intro, and then we're basically going to camp out on Ephesians chapter 2. So let's get started. Um, I think you'll have a videotape of this and you'll have a copy of the presentation, so you'll be able to go through those verses later on. Let's start with Revelation. Why Revelation? Well, one, it's the future, and so for something that will impact my life, some people can say the past, yes, I should know about that because that might impact my life today. The present, yes, that will impact my life today. But definitely the future, I'm very interested in how that's going to impact my life. Because the future, something that's still going to happen, I might have a chance to do something about it. And so let's start at Revelation chapter 2. Chapter 2, this is the story of God talking to John and God revealing to John a future. When is that future? Some people say it's not for a long time. Some people say it's soon, very, very soon. And God is show, talking to John and saying a revelation of the future. And in this particular case, chapter 2, in the first few verses, is about a church called Ephesus. It says, to the synagogue in Ephesus. And it says, God knows your deeds. That means God sees, this is the future, God saw everything before that. He saw everything from that time till now. So He sees us now. He sees us, He saw us yesterday, and He saw us from the beginning of time. That's pretty important. God sees. He's talking about the future and he says, God sees your deeds. He says, your hard work, your perseverance, I cannot, you cannot toler tolerate wick wicked people. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered, we talked about that last week, and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. When God makes a compliment about us, that's pretty good. That's God making a compliment about us. And that's pretty good, especially since this compliment happens in the future. That means we did this. We are going to be doing this if we haven't done it yet, or we are already doing it and God sees it. That's pretty amazing. That's something to celebrate about. But when you go to the next verse, it says, but, I hate that word. <laughs> but means it's about to reverse everything that just, I just heard. But I have this against you. You have forgotten the love you had at first. Okay. 
I can deal with that. You have forgotten the love you had at first. But he doesn't stop there. This is God talking to us. He says, recognize how far you have fallen. So this is not missed it by this much. This is missed it by a lot. Not according to my opinion or your opinion, according to God's opinion. And he doesn't stop there. He says, repent. That means it isn't like, okay, I did it. I told you you've sinned by this much. Now I forgive you. No. He says, repent. That means do something. Repent. How? Go back to the love you had at first. And he doesn't stop there. He says, if you do not, I will take your lampstand away from you. That's pretty serious. This is God. This is the future. And when I read this, I said, the first part I was feeling really good. I was more holy than holy. God was complimenting me, and I know it because it's in the Bible. And then he says, but, and I was insulted. But, you forgot the love you had at first. That's impossible. You, God, just told me I did all these things in your name. I did that in love. How could you possibly tell me that you have this against me? You forgot the love you had at first. I did not forget you. I did not forget you. I've been fighting for you. Besides, Lord, if you are expect you're complimenting me for doing a battle, which is fighting, how could you criticize me about love? Love and battle does not go together. There's something wrong with this verse, the way I'm reading it. But I can't ignore it because it's the future. And the future is being told by God, and it has an action required, and it has consequences if you do not do this action. Go back to the love you had at first. But I don't understand it, Lord. How do I go back to the love I had at first? Who are we talking about? You, Lord? Well, I don't remember forgetting about our love. You just told me. Are you talking about someone else? And then I discovered this book called Ephesians. I think it's in the New Testament. But I found out it was actually a letter a letter from a Jew named Paul. And he was writing it to a congregation, a place called Ephesus. All right. Next. So who are we talking about? Where? We now know it's talking, Revelation is talking about Ephesus. And the people were there called Ephesians. What are we talking? What am I looking for? What is this love that you're talking about that I lost? And when did this happen? This was about 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years ago. Next. In chapter 2, verse, starting in verse 1 through 5, it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the courses of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. You, who's talking? Paul, a Jew, is talking to you, the congregation Ephesus. Most of us, when we read this book and we've ever studied this book, there's one thing we have to start from the beginning. We read the book as if there's two people here, Paul and the congregation of Ephesus, the church. 
And for a moment, just for today, let's give a different view. This is Paul, a Jew, talking to a congregation called Ephesus, and there's two peoples in this congregation, Jews and Gentiles. So is this you, you, meaning Jews and Gentiles? Or is it more? Let's go to the next verse. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Does that sound like a repeat to you? I want to suggest to you that he's talking to two different people. You, I'm a Jew, Paul, you, Gentiles in Ephesus, are dead in trespasses, among whom also we, Jews, including me, Paul, are also dead in trespasses. He's talking to two different people, not one church. He is writing a letter. He's in prison. He's writing a letter to two different people, Gentiles and Jews. You, the Gentiles, and we, the Jews. Next verse. But, here's that thing again. But this time, this but is good. Because in the first one, we heard about good things from God. But in this verses, Gentiles, dead in trespasses. Well, that's not good. Jews, dead in trespasses. Well, that's not good either. But, that means something's about to change. There's a third character, God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love for us. This is Ephesians. This is the introduction. We need to know who are we talking about here. Gentiles, dead in trespasses. Jews, dead in trespasses. But God is about to reverse it all. Why? Because he is rich in mercy because of his great love for us. He has to do something. He did something 2,000 years ago in Ephesus. These are the three characters of this love story that we're going to hear about tonight. Next verse. What's God going to do? So we now know, go back. We now know that who that we're talking about here? God, Jews, and Gentiles. So let's continue. Next verse. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he has a three-step program for us. He's going to make us alive together. Number two, he's going to make us sit together. And finally, we're going to grow up together. What's the together here? This is, we're going to make, he's going to make us alive, Jews and Gentiles, together. He's going to make us sit, Jews and Gentiles, together. And he's going to make us grow up, Jews and Gentiles, together. That's the three-step plan. Does these three things make sense? Why these three? Why not one? Why not five? Next verse. So we now know how. He's going to save us. He's going to make us sit together. And he's going to make us grow up together. Why? Number one, we know the Jews and Gentiles are dead. God has to fix that. What does he have to do? Make you alive. The second thing we need to know is in this time, Jews and Gentiles hated each other. The word is called enmity, a deep-seated hatred for each other. Enmity. We hated each other. How is God going to fix that? He has to make us sit together in peace. That's why he's called the Prince of Peace. He gives us salvation and peace. We just read that in our half Torah today. So that second one makes sense. The third one is the best part. Because the first two just fixes the broken things. 
our death and our hatred. The third one is for the future. Now that we're fixed, he has a plan for us, a future and a hope. It's called growing up together in him. A three-step program. Next slide. Why? He said, so that in the ages to come, that means the future, in the ages to come, he will show us his amazing grace and kindness towards us. This is God's simple plan. I just love you. That's it. I love you, but you don't want to listen. You don't want to listen. Next slide. So we know who, what, where, when, why, and how. Let's go forward. The first step, salvation. It's a big argument. Grace versus law. And he covers it in Ephesians. Next slide. Chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through your faith, and not, by yourself, but not of yourselves, it is a gift from God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. How many of you has heard that verse? We love that verse. And this is where we get the argument. I'm saved by grace. I don't have to do anything else. The law is gone. The other camp says, no, I don't believe that. But it says right here, you are saved by grace through your faith, not of yourself, not of your works is usually what we say. But before that, I want you to understand salvation. He's going to save you. Why? Because you're dead. He's going to save you. He says it requires two things. I bet you never heard that. It requires two things. It requires God's grace plus your faith in God's grace. That's salvation. I want to repeat that. God's grace without your faith does not get you salvation. Your faith without God's grace does not get you salvation. It says right there, God's grace through your faith. It's a relationship between two. It's a love story. And it's not of your works because you might brag about how good you've been. But the part that most of us haven't heard or memorized is the next verse, which is very important. For God's grace, you have been saved. Your faith, and not of your, plus your faith, your, through your faith, and not of yourselves. I want to make that clear. It is God's grace, and it is your faith, not God's faith. The reason why this is important is when we go to the next verse in chapter, uh, verse 10. Keep going. For we are God's worksman, workmanship, created in Yeshua for God's good works, which God had already prepared beforehand so that you can do them. That sounds like a contradiction to me. Verse 10 is saying, the reason why He's saving us is because we are His creation and He created us to do His works so that we can do them. So it seems like 8 and 9 is a contradiction to 10, but really it's not. Because 8 and 9 says, your works is not of your works, your works got you dead. Your works got you dead. That's why God has to save you. We, we learned that in, chapter, in verse 1 and 2. 
Your works got you dead. That's why God is saying, it's not your works that got you salvation. It's your faith that God has mercy despite your works. And in verse 10, he continues, I am saving you because I created you for my works so that you will do them. What is this works? He said he created it beforehand. That would be before Paul, before Yeshua, maybe the Torah. Many people say that the Torah is God's instructions for love. So you could say, God created you so that you could follow His instructions for love so that you can follow it and love. That's why He's saving you, so that you can love. Salvation. The law is not an obligation. The law is a gift from God also, so that you will learn how to love according to God. That's love. That's love. If you love somebody, don't kill them, don't lie to them, don't steal, don't commit adultery. That's love. It's not love when you say, I love you, I want to marry you, but I'm going to steal from you, I'm going to lie from you, I'm going to cheat. But I just want to let you know that, that I'm already saved by grace. This is not love. If you tell this to an unbeliever, it is not love. If you tell this to a believer, it is not love. You tell this to God and He will laugh at you. Salvation. Your works got you dead. So God's grace and your faith that He will forgive you will get you saved. So that we can continue with God's original plan. He created you to love. And He gave you instructions on how to do it. So now you can do it again. Let's go forward. Next verse. Law and grace is not against each other. Law and grace is the same. It's a gift from God. Both. There is no contradiction. Keep going. And then out of nowhere, Instead of going to step two and step three, God says, therefore remember, next verse, therefore remember that you, in this case, to be clear, Gentiles, you at that time were without Yeshua, you at that time were aliens to the commonwealth of Israel, you at that time were strangers from the covenants, no hope, and without God. I'm a Gentile. This verse doesn't feel good to me. Especially if I was there and it was a Jew telling me this. How many of you here are Jewish? How many are Gentiles? Can you imagine? Gentiles, you are strangers to the commonwealth of Israel, no hope and without God. Paul goes out of the way in his letter to remind the Gentiles part of the congregation, remember why? I thought we were all one happy, clappy, one congregation. Why? Why is Paul doing this? Remember, I know. And Paul said, no, you don't. You're now sitting together. Yes, you're sitting together to know more about Yeshua. But Paul wasn't sure if you, what your relationship was with each other. You had many teachings about this. What good is your relationship with Yeshua if you're Gentile and hate a Jew? Or if you're Jew and hate a Gentile? Yeshua died so that this can happen. 
because you were both dead in trespasses, you hated each other, and God had to crush His only Son so that you can be saved and He can bring you peace again. A peace that the world cannot understand. Cannot understand. Now, we sit together. How is he going to do this? Next verse. But, that's great. You Gentiles are with no hope and without God. But God, now through Yeshua, who comes once, when once we were far off, have been brought near, for He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one. Both one here doesn't mean Gentiles and Yeshua. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles. Through Yeshua, we are both one. One, despite our trespasses, despite our hatred for each other, if you believe in His grace, both can become alive and both can become one again in peace. Is this possible? Is this possible? 2,000 years ago, there was a congregation sitting there, Jews and Gentiles. What are you talking about? I'm here because I want to listen to Yeshua. I don't want to sit next to the other person. Well, I don't know, the Jews were saying, I don't know why they're here. And the Gentiles were going, why are we here? This is a Jewish thing. But through Yeshua, He has a plan. And he says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the hatred for each other, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. How many of you have heard this one new man verse? It's beautiful. One new man. Unfortunately, most of the world interpret this one new man as that me and God. Me and God. One new man. And I wondered about that and asked, well, if the one new man is you and God, you, new man, the new believer man, then who's the old man? The unbeliever is usually what we automatically assume. And then it says, one new man from the two. So the believer me and the unbeliever me becomes one. No. We know the actors, what he's talking about, one new man from the two, Jews and Gentiles. That's the one new man. It's not the believer man. The one new man from the two. That he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting the death to enmity. Most of us are not familiar with this particular verse because we got stuck on the previous verse that says, God abolished the enmity, that is, the law and the commandments. And the people that wanted to push the theology that is grace and we don't need law, says, see, I told you, God abolished the law. No, He didn't abolish the law, He abolished the enmity. And it repeats it in this next verse, putting to death the enmity, not the law. Putting to death our hatred for each other. That's how we're able to sit together as one new man, Jews and Gentiles. 
After this, we're fixed. Going to. After this, we're fixed. We're alive instead of dead. We're at peace. One new man together as one from the two. Now we're sitting together. Great. We're done. Salvation. Let's go to heaven. That was 2,000 years ago. As far as I know, this is not heaven where I am. So something else has to happen. Step three, growing up together. Next verse. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Now, therefore, you Gentiles are no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the Jews and the members of the household of God. That's the good part for the Gentiles. <coughs> and God, it's God's plan. Next. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and Yeshua being the cornerstone of that foundation. Stop. Where did this building come from? Why are we talking about buildings all of a sudden? There's a building. The foundation is apostles and prophets. It's called, as far as I know, prophets were Jews, the apostles were Jews, and Yeshua is Jewish. So this building that has this foundation that God is going to build from is Jewish, entirely Jewish. Next slide. In whom the whole building being fitted together, what's the together? Jews and Gentiles, grows up into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also are being built together, a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So now he's talking about, now let's talk about the future. We're going to be doing something together, we're alive, we're going to be doing something together, and here's the plan. We're going to build a temple, and that temple is going to be a holy temple. And this temple, the foundation is Jewish. The rest of the walls still has to be built using Jews and Gentiles together. And you are not finished until you have a holy temple for the Lord. Why does the Lord need a holy temple? So that He can dwell in it. Does the Lord need a house? The holy temple is not a building. The holy temple is not a church, a building, a religion, a denomination. A holy temple is a people of Jews and Gentiles, in peace, alive, in love, in Yeshua. That's what we're building. We're building a peoples, a holy peoples, if I replace the word temple. You come together, the foundation is Jewish, do not build a building outside of that. Build the walls together, Jews and Gentiles, not just Gentiles, not just Jews. And you're not finished until you have a holy temple, a holy people for the Lord, so that He can dwell in the people, the holy people. You know what that sounds like? Yeshua, the bride's groom, the church, the building, the temple, his wife. God allows marriage as long as they're equally yoked. If God is holy, 
he can only marry holy. And if we are going to be his bride, that church, that temple, the holy people, we have to be a holy people. A holy people for his bride. That's what the third plan is. I'm coming back for my holy temple. I'm coming back for my church. I'm coming back for my bride. And the bride is Jews and Gentiles in peace, in love, in the Messiah. That was easy. But you know what? 2,000 years ago, that was not easy. You want me to get together with him? No way. And the other guy said, that's okay, I don't want you either. That was 2,000 years ago. But you know what's funny? It's still the same now. It's still the same now. This is what my biggest concern is. Revelation says, you forgot the love you had at first. You're fighting in my name, you're persevering in my name, but what are you fighting for? You're supposed to be busy building the house, the temple, the holy people. The holy people equals Jews plus Gentiles plus alive, in peace, in love. And we can only do it to the Messiah because we can't do it on our own. We've proven it before Paul and we've proven it 2,000 years after Paul today. We can't do it. You listen to the news. There will not be a day or an hour that you will not hear about Israel. And what it says about Israel has nothing to do with love. It has something to do with Jews, it has something to do with Gentiles, but it is not in peace, in love. What it is, I'm going to kill you. So Revelation says, Recognize how far you have fallen. You're doing all these things. You know Yeshua, you know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know this, you know that. You go to church, you go to synagogue, you do all the prayers. I saw what you were doing. I congratulate you, but I have this against you. You forgot what you were fighting for. You forgot the love you had at first. You forgot the one new man. You forgot you're building a holy temple. You forgot you're the bride of the Messiah. So maybe next week the Messiah comes, the bride, I mean the bride's groom, and says, oh, I'm looking for my bride. I'm Jewish, let me go to the synagogue. Oh, I see Jews. Where are the Gentiles? Well, that's not my bride. I go over to the churches. I heard they've got bigger ones. I go in there and I see a bunch of Gentiles. No Jews. I don't recognize who I got engaged to. I want to look for him. Look for her. Where is this? Where is my bride? I died for this bride, to wash them clean, whiter than snow, to present them to my Father blameless. A humanity, a one new humanity from the two, from Jews and Gentiles, in peace, in love, in the Messiah. What happened? This is God's plan, three-step program. We know in the time of Paul that, Paul that he did it. What happened? We had such a good start. 
What's our beginning? God's plan. What happened? That's love. That's love defined by God, not by us. When did he define it? From the beginning. I, Abraham, I'm going to make you a mighty nation. I will do things to you that the world, the other nations, has never seen. To set you apart from all the other nations. Why? So that you will be a blessing to all the nations. That's his plan. Two thousand years later, he has to send his son and crush him. Because what he saw? Gentiles, the nations, dead in trespasses. And Israel, his nation, his mighty nation, to be a blessing, set apart for all the nations, to be a blessing to all the nations, were dead in trespasses too. But God, because of His great love for us, Jews and Gentiles, crushed His only Son so we can live. He didn't die for nothing. He died so we could have that love again. What happened to us? This is love. This is series 9a in your teachings about love. This is love in real life. This is love that was defined in the past, this is love that is still defined in the present. And this is love, the definition is going to remain the same in the future. And scripture tells us, go back to the love you had at first. Rabbi David calls it a scandalous love. A scandalous love. If you want to talk here about love, everything's pretty and nice and everything. No, this God's love is a scandalous love. Not because God likes scandal, but because we don't want to follow His love. We want to redefine what love is. And He's saying, no, I love you. What part of this don't you understand? I love you, but you don't know how. So I give you instructions so that you can follow them. They're called love. The Ten Commandments is instructions for love. Mm -hmm. And then you apply that to each other. Why to each other? Because the closest thing we will ever get to God's love is what we do here. What we do here. When God was creating, He said, I created this, it is good. I created this, it is good. The first time God ever said something was bad, it is not good for Adam to be alone. Why is it not good? You can't have love by yourself. It is not good for man to be alone. So He created two, husband and wife. Love requires two. In the time of Yeshua, God is demonstrating to the whole world love as a whole. Humanity and God. And humanity is going to be married to my son. But my son is holy. So humanity has to be holy. How do you become a holy humanity? Love. Love. Holiness is love. Love is God. So what He created in Ephesians is us humans, 
who are dead in trespasses, that means, by the way, we didn't follow the instructions for love, so we don't know how to love. We're dead of love. We hate each other because we don't love. That's enmity. And God fixes the broken things and says, let's go. You're born again. Let's try it again. Let's get this right. Love. Now practice, Adam and Eve. Practice, Adam and Eve, Jew and Gentile. Become one. Become one. When I go to the, when Yeshua goes to the synagogue, I can hear him recalling, it is not good for a man to be alone. It is not good for Jews to be alone. Why? You can't get love by yourself. It is not good for Gentiles to be alone. Why? Because you can't get love by yourself. I created the divine plan, Jews and Gentiles, in peace, in love, in a Messiah. We better figure out how this love between Jews and Gentiles was supposed to go because we failed. We failed by a long shot. And in the future, God is saying, repent and go back to the love you had at first, Jews and Gentiles. Otherwise, I will take your status as my bride away from you. I can't. Holy cannot be in the same space and time as unholy. And I have given you a way. Love each other, Jews and Gentiles. And by the way, God did us a favor. The Jews will never disappear until the plan is done. So we got one already. Even if the Jews don't want to be here anymore, they can't. They're going to be here. God said so. So they're going to be here. Gentiles, that's good. Because we can't do it alone. We require the Jews to be in love. And the Jews have been instructed, you stick around, I will make you a mighty nation so that you can love and bless the nations. It's required. Does that sound like husband and wife? God's requirement of a husband? You have to stick around. Your job is to bring your wife, wash her clean, whiter than snow, so that you can present her to the Father blameless. Husband and wives. You might say, Raul, that has nothing to do with husband and wives. This is Jews and Gentiles. Next week, we will cover Paul wrote about husband and wives in Ephesians. You follow those rules, and he's using an analogy of how Jews and Gentiles are supposed to stay together. It's love. What did Rabbi David say? Love is others-based. Self-sacrifice for the other. And choice-based. You have to choose. God is coming soon, and he's looking down like, I don't see her anywhere. I better help them out again. So in the past 20 years, more Jewish people have come to the Lord compared to the past 1,700 years. And it's not because of Gentile evangelism. <laughs> because God says, it's time to fulfill your calling, my firstborn. Be a mighty nation and be a blessing to all the nations. And in the past 20 years, more Gentiles are all of a sudden curious about the foundations of my faith. Since when have Gentiles ever been curious about the foundations of our faith? 
we've been busy trying to erase the foundations of our faith because it's too Jewish. But one by one, all over the world, not connected to each other, Gentiles are curious about the foundations of their faith. I didn't know Jesus was Jewish. I didn't know the apostles were Jews. I didn't know the Old Testament and the New Testament was written by all Jews. I thought they had nothing to do with this. God is doing that, not us. He's bringing the Jews and the Gentiles and putting him in little rooms like this and said, it's done? No, it's not done. Because love, if others based, self-sacrificial, and a choice. I can put you together, but you have to choose to love each other. I cannot do that for you. You can listen to the teachings about Yeshua and God all day long. And every teaching tells you, go look at your neighbor and love. Jews and Gentiles. It's time. He's coming. What's happened in the past 20 years is supernatural. Supernatural. You have to do something because he can't do this part. Love. Next slide. A scandalous love story to be lived out moment by moment. Next week, we'll talk about what went wrong. What went wrong? Thank you. For more information, visit us at www.etzheim.org. That's spelled E-I-T-Z dash C-H-A-I-M dot org. Or join us in Richardson, Texas for our weekly Shabbat services.